offices. So after meeting inshallah, we can share our experience too. So let's go to the lung ventilation and we'll see here, this is a lung inflation curve and the relation between pressure and volume of the lung. We'll see that with increasing pressure, at the start there is less compliance of the lung and with large increase of, high of pressure, there is minimal change of the alveolar volume. And then we reach to the safe window. This safe window is our target of ventilation, either by conventional mechanical ventilation or other modes of mechanical ventilation. But further increase of pressure that make over distension, also in this zone, the lung is less compliant and more liable to injury. So if we apply the conventional mechanical ventilation to the high frequency mechanical ventilation, we'll see that in, in high frequency ventilation, there is a less variation between the maximum and minimum points of inflation, unlike the conventional mechanical ventilation. And so we can divide the injuries that can be uh, uh, introduced to lung during in, uh, ventilation to barotrauma, which represent high pressure that be introduced to the lung, volutrauma that present over distension if the lung stay in the over distension zone, and atelectotrauma that means the lung is in the collapse zone, and so the collapse and recurrent reopening of the alveoli making shearing force that will induce also uh, lung injury, and all of this injury will induce release of cytokines that will make more failure to the uh, lungs and other organs that's called biotrauma. So our target ventilation is to keep in the safe window. Let's talk about the types of high frequency ventilation can be used in our practical uh, uh, field of practice. First of all, high frequency oscillatory ventilation, and this is the most common, and we'll spend all the lecture talking about this mode in details. Second type is high frequency jet ventilation. And in this mode, we are using the ventilation and introducing small jets of uh, tidal volume through small bore cannula that can be introduced through the ETT. This cannula gives small volume of tidal volume equal one ml per kg in higher rates from 100 to 150. So the mean airway pressure become less than high frequency oscillatory ventilation. And by the way, less than the conventional mechanical ventilation. So here, maybe it's not a good option for recruitment of the lung, but it's a very good option to prevent further injury. If you want to recruit the lung, we can connect the high frequency jet ventilation to conventional mechanical ventilation or even CBAB just to give beep for the patient. This requires more sedation and sometimes paralysis. Uh, the third, uh, type is high frequency percussive ventilation. And this actually combination between two types of ventilation, high frequency oscillatory ventilation and conventional mechanical ventilation. So if you see here, you will find there is oscillation around BIB and B. This is very beneficial in patients with excessive secretion to expel this secretions out. The fourth type, actually this one is obsolete now. This high frequency positive pressure ventilation. This means with the regular conventional ventilation, you increase the rate to the maximum of the machine, but this can induce more lung injury. So this type is obsolete now. So let's talk about theory and mode of action of the high frequency oscillatory ventilation. The main idea is to give small tidal volume that's equal to the dead space of the lung from the ATT to terminal uh, bronchiole. This small tidal volume will not cause injury uh, to the lung, reduce the barotrauma and volutrauma, and give this small tidal volume in higher rates, which is called frequency. One frequency equals 60 breaths per minute. So the available frequencies from 3 to 20, this means from 180 to 1,200 breaths per minute. Now let's see the dynamics of machine and the mechanics of the lung. This is called piston. This piston is the most important part of the high frequency ventilation, it's at a diaphragm moving in and out during inspiration and expiration. So here the expiration is the act is active, and this is the only active uh, expiration can be found in all modes of uh, mechanical ventilation. And this has a very beneficial use that it prevents further air leak or further uh, over inflation of the lung. So through this piston, the mechanical ventilation can give small tidal volume that bust through restrictive valve on the inexpiratory limb so keep the lung all the time recruited with minimal oscillation around the mean airway pressure as you see here. If you look to the green arrow this means 
this high frequency and the yellow arrow here is lower frequency. With high frequency, the time for fresh gas to, to go inside the lung and wash the CO2 is low. So with increasing frequency, CO2 wash become low. And this also a big difference between conventional mechanical ventilation and high frequency mechanical ventilation. With high frequency mechanical ventilation, increasing frequency meaning increase CO2. So big question, if we uh, supplying the lung with low tidal volume, how can be the terminal alveoli be ventilated? You can look here to this animated the, the, uh, diagram and see the mechanics uh, of gas uh, diffusion during high frequency mechanical ventilation. While we'll talk about theories, the exact mechanism is unclear. Maybe it's a combination of all of this theory. This theory is collateral ventilation between alveoli, which means if this alveoli become ventilated, because of collaterals between alveoli, the adjacent alveoli can be also ventilated. And second theory, the ventilation of those alveoli that's close to the proximal bronchiole by direct ventilation. But the, one of the most theory is Bindeloft mixing. If you look here to this alveoli, you will find different types of alveoli with different compliance. Here is a uh, highly collapsed alveoli, and this is highly distended alveoli. During conventional mechanical ventilation, the gas go in and out uh, in laminar way. So this gas will be distributed equally or, uh, over this all alveoli. If we give high tidal volume to expand this alveoli, the distended alveoli will rupture. If we give low tidal volume to save this alveoli, this alveoli will stay in atelectasis zone. But in high frequency ventilation, because of turbulence of the gas in and out, during expiration, not all gas coming out of the alveoli, but it diffuses from this alveoli to the adjacent alveoli. With repeated inspiration and expiration, all of this alveoli will become recruited at the same point and at the same degree with minimal tidal volume. And the next theory is bulk convection. This means oxygen absorption to the adjacent capillaries act as a vacuum power for more gas to go to the distal alveoli. And last two theories is Taylor dispersion and coaxial flow. This uh, can explain the flow of gas during the passing through the bronchiole. There is two forces, one rapid jet that go deeper and carry fresh gas to the distal alveoli and peripheral slow jet that carry CO2 out of the bronchiole. Advantages of high frequency ventilation. One of the major advantages of high frequency ventilation is that you can adjust vent uh, ventilation apart from oxygenation. If you increase, by the way, uh, BIB on conventional mechanical ventilation, this will, will wash CO2. But on the other hand, it also affects your saturation. But in high frequency, you can control every part of the ventilation and oxygenation uh, independent of the other part. Uh, second thing that you give small tidal volume, so we are making sure that the lung cannot be furtherly injured by this low tidal volume. High frequency oscillatory ventilation also is a good way to recruit the lung. And by this recruitment, you will decrease the data space. And by decreasing the data space, you will improve both ventilation and perfusion. The advantage of high frequency ventilation, it's machine like other machine. If using uh, the machine in wrong way, you will face the side effects. Uh, so when used in correct way and avoid over distension, all of this is at this advantage will be avoided. One of the disadvantage is human error. If the machine is disconnected from the patient, all recruitment of the lung will be lost and will go back to zero state before placing the FI as a high frequency ventilation. Also, it requires heavy sedation and paralysis, especially in older children. So what's the indication of high frequency? One of the biggest indication is using high frequency as a rescue therapy. That means that you are using high frequency after failure of conventional mechanical ventilation. So the failure of, of conventional ventilation can be divided into two parts, ventilation failure and oxygenation failure. Ventilation failures that mean you have permissive hypercapnia, pH less than 7.25, despite of high CO2 and using high plateau pressure more than 30 for two hours. Oxygenation failure that mean if you are calculating oxygen index as shown here by calculating the FiO2, in conventional mechanical ventilation and uh, multiplied by mean airway pressure divided by the BO2, 
if you have oxygen index more than 20 to 25 over six hours period, this is called oxygenation failure. So oxygen index should be less than 15. This is a normal oxygen index. Oxygen index more than 40, this indication for ECMO. More than 20, it's a indication of high frequency. The gray zone between 15 and 20, that's we can talk about and debate about this. It depends on the experience of the uh, respiratory therapist for the uh, availability of high frequency for other protective maneuvers you can do. Other relative indication of high frequency oscillatory ventilation, it's, it's used in air leak and surgical emphysema, pneumothorax because of active uh, expiratory phase that can making the gas go, go out of the lung and prevent further air leak. Meconium aspiration syndrome is a combination between collapsed alveoli and hyperdistended alveoli because of the ball valve mechanism can be found in meconium aspiration. So high frequency is a good option to recruit all of these alveoli and prevent uh, gas leak. Persistent pulmonary hypertension will talk about high frequency because it's one of the good points of high frequency uh, ventilation in treating persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn. A contraindication of high frequency, if you have patient hemodynamically unstable, it's unlogic to shift him from uh, conventional mechanical ventilation to high frequency mechanical ventilation. If you have patient with end stage, you should go to palliative, not more advanced uh, method. If you have like tracheal stenosis, this will prevent this small tidal volume to go to this alveoli. So what's the, one of the major contraindication to high frequency ventilation. Also increasing pulmonary uh, pain pressure like intracranial hemorrhage, this also contraindication to high frequency because we will say inshallah later that one of the methods used in high frequency is permissive hypercapnia and you depend this patient to have high CO2 and patient with intracranial hemorrhage cannot tolerate this level of high CO2. Now let's go to the machine, how to deal with the machine of high frequency this is the most common machine used in our uh, ICU. Uh, we have six parameters on this machine. Three of them are dealing with oxygenation and the other three are dealing with ventilation. So first of all is the mean airway pressure, which represents the distending pressure to the lung. This value is here, can be adjusted from the knob here. Uh, roughly, if we are using this during rescue therapy, after failure of conventional ventilation, we are using three to five plus mean airway pressure and conventional mechanical ventilation. Increasing this parameter will improve the oxygenation and saturation of the patient. This parameter depends on the bias flow here. This bias flow, actually it's, we are using in our practice from 10 to 20, it's almost fixed, but you should give the bias flow that's sufficient to give the desired mean airway pressure. Third parameter is FiO2. We control FiO2 by external blender that's attached to the uh, machine. And usually we start during transition from conventional to high frequency at 100% FiO2, and then give the priority to weaning to FiO2 once the patient is stable. So now let's talk about the parameters are dealing with uh, ventilation or wash of CO2. One of the most important parameter is Delta B. This is the one. Here Delta B can be adjusted from the knob here, and roughly we start by 1.5 to 2 time as the mean airway pressure. And this delta B represents the wiggling or vibration <clears throat> of the machine around the mean airway pressure. Roughly, you should start it as you see good wiggling on the patient. Good wiggling depends on the age of the patient. If newborn, it should be down to the level of umbilicus. If infant, it should be to, down to the level of hip. In older children or adolescent, down to the level of mid -side. Once you adjust the parameter here, take care that the oscillation of the piston will not be on the, uh, uh, centralized at this point. So it can be adjusted from knob here down in the machine, just to make sure that the vibration in both ways across the main airway pressure are equal. Frequency, this is the parameter here. Roughly we are using frequency at 10, especially if the patient is less than 10 kg. In older uh, children, more than 10 kg, we are using frequency of Eight. And we mentioned before, increasing frequency will increase the CO2. And spiratory time, this is almost fixed parameter. We are using 33%, which means that IE ratio is one to two. 
increasing this parameter will wash CO2, but on the other hand, will decrease the time for moving gas out of the lung. So it gives high incidence for gas leak to happen. So now we are talking about six parameters. Let's revise it again. By the fi 2 around 10 to 20, frequency almost fixed at 10, inspiratory time almost fixed at 33. So we are dealing with only two parameters in high frequency oscillatory ventilation, and this is much easier than the conventional mechanical ventilation, mean airway pressure controlling oxygenation, delta B controlling ventilation. So how to manage ventilation? First of all, increasing delta B till you see good wiggling. Second, you can decrease the frequency. You can decrease the frequency uh, to wash out CO2. If this couldn't help, so you can increase the mean airway pressure. And this is a situation that we mentioned, mean airway pressure could help in uh, washing CO2. And refractory hypercapnia, you can increase the uh, time of inspiration. And managing oxygenation, increasing mean airway pressure is the only parameters, if you're making the FIO2 at 100%, is the only parameter used to improve the oxygenation. So what's the important consideration before putting the patient on high frequency? Hemodynamic status should be hemodynamically stable, the sedation, as we mentioned before. And if you want to do off-unit procedure like MRI, CT, once patient put on high frequency ventilation cannot be weaned. So do your, your procedure before putting patient on high frequency. And one of the most important things that you should talk to the parents, wiggling is not a nice sound and see the patient vibration is not a nice to see by parents, so you should prepare them. So guidelines of high frequency ventilation, high volume or open lung strategies, this is the most common use. And this one we mentioned before, we start with mean airway pressure, three to five centimeter before mean airway pressure in conventional mechanical ventilation with FI to 100. And then you can do recruitment every 10 minutes by increasing mean airway pressure by two centimeters. Once you found that increasing mean airway pressure associated with desaturation, then you reach the over distension zone, go back to the previous uh, uh, value of mean airway pressure. Frequency and delta B, as we mentioned before, and the, our target here, saturation above 90% to keep pH more than 7.25, despite of uh, carbon dioxide, which is called permissive hypercabinet. And this is the wise algorithm re, uh, uh, revealing the uh, recruitment of the lung procedure till we reach the uh, safe wound. Another common uh, indication of high frequency, it's used in uh, early. Here, if you find this test lung in conventional mechanical ventilation, you find here there is air leak and the adjacent alveoli cannot be properly ventilated. Unlike here, with high frequency ventilation, you cannot find any leak from this area because of low tidal volume and all adjacent alveoli can be equally ventilated because of wiggling. Open airway strategy, least common use of high frequency and can be used in severe uh, small airway stenosis like acute severe asthma. Here, mean airway pressure just used to stint the distal bronchi and then the active phase will wash out the gas out of the alveoli, prevent further overinflation. So how to troubleshooting? If you face hypoxia, it's all about mean airway pressure. You do X-ray. If you find the uh, diaphragm posteriorly higher than eight rib, you should increase the mean airway pressure lower than 10 rib, decrease the mean airway pressure, increase the FIO2 and optimize patient status regarding uh, hemoglobin and perfusion. Hyperoxia, go to the opposite side, wins the FIO2 and mean airway pressure. Hypercapnia, increase delta B first, then decrease the frequency. If you find no uh, um, desirable effect, go for mean airway pressure, it, it should be low, then increase. For hypocapnia, win the delta B, increase the frequency. For overinflation, if you find by X-ray overinflation, you reduce the mean airway pressure and decrease the delta. If you find that your patient has hypotension or increase in CVB, first of all, consider of over distension. So reduce the mean airway pressure. You can give volume expansion and vasopressor, or if all of this maneuver failed, consider putting back the patient to conventional mechanical ventilation. This is uh, just a summary of all troubleshooting you can face during 
high frequency oscillatory ventilation. For patient assessment, you should document vital signs. You can auscultate to the patient, just press on the piston, turn off the piston, listen to the heart sound, listen to the GIT sounds, and then put back the piston as long as the patient on sealed connection, the, the lung still recruited. Nursing management is all about position and reposition. It's better to put the high frequency at the head of the infant. So if you are turning the patient to the right or to the left side, you avoid this connection of the tube. If happen and there's this connection, you can increase the mean airway pressure by 20% for two minutes to re-recruit the lung again. Regarding suction, we are using inline suction and suction during high frequency should be minimized only if wiggling decrease, if you find the patient is desaturation. If you are winning high frequency ventilation, first of all, you increase the FiO2 down to 60% and then start weaning mean airway pressure by one to two. And then you can win the patient if small infant or neonate and without paralysis, you can win them from high frequency ventilation to autoplane. In older children under heavy sedation or paralysis, you should win them first to conventional mechanical ventilation. Now, cardiovascular interaction, I think we can take a break here, Dr. Adib. Oh, thank you, Haytham. Uh, we'll give 10 minutes break for the people who want to catch prayer in their cities. Meanwhile, Dr. Al Harbi, you are around. Dr. Ali? Dr. Al Harbi, yeah. meanwhile, during the break time, we'll pull some questions uh, to be reviewed before we start our next session. So, inshallah, we'll start at 8.35 for our session, inshallah. Sounds good. Thank you. We have the bull question. Can you put it clearly? Probably I need like uh, two minutes uh, uh, to be activated the poll question. So give me a while if you don't mind. Yep. Assalamu alaikum. We have this break time for the people in the Western area, Jeddah especially, to 
pray. And in the meantime, we are going to submit some uh, bull question. Dr. Ali is uh, putting this uh, bull question now, just in a minute. Thank you for being patient, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, now we have a uh, pool's question, Brebeba Trali. Uh, yeah, how frequently you use uh, high frequency in PCICU, single choice? Dr. Abdullah, we cannot see the ball question. You can't see it? We cannot see it. Okay. Dr. Ali, can you share it again? Dr. Ali is the host? Yeah, he's the host. There is some people answer. Can you see it now again? Some people can see it. It's open. Uh, my cat open or closed? Relaunch. Okay. Now. So, yeah, some people are answering. So the question is, guys, is how frequency, frequently uh, you use high frequency 
on uh, PCICU? It is a uh, single answer, either 20%, 40%, 60%, or 80%. We got only seven uh, people, uh, and we'll give like uh, uh, a few minutes before sharing the results. Looks like we have uh, almost nine answers. So it's around uh, 20 percent. It's less frequent, I can say, compared to the uh, medical ICU. Which is expected answer, actually. And that's why we this, with this topic as a challenge. Uh, to see what is the challenges that can face everyone, and we're gonna explore this in discussion, inshallah, more. Now, Dr. Haytham, you can resume your session, or uh, we have another ball, I think, Dr. Alisa. Yeah. yeah so, the, the second ball discussing about the advantage. So, uh, do you think uh, high frequency on PCICU has more advantage, more disadvantage? or you think is uh, equal no whether there is no difference between whether to have advantage or disadvantage i think yes uh, if you discuss about uh, cardiopulmonary interaction on high frequency it is debatable and i think you guys bring the talk uh, 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 to it is a coming slide, it is a coming slide now. <laughs> yeah I will talk to the main meal today, inshallah. Oh, oh, if you finish your appetizer, now I'll go to main meal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Surprising uh, answers. I'll share the result, guys. So, uh, most of the people, uh, they think, it's around 55% of the people, they think have uh, advantage. Uh, so, uh, and 10% uh, they have, they think have disadvantage and around 15% they think is equal. Okay, shukran Dr. Ali and thank you uh, guys for staying with us. We're gonna go to the main meal uh, and please save your questions. We have another two balls, Dr. Ali will bolt them in the middle between the slides, you'll interrupt Dr. Haytham to put the balls. And uh, please go ahead, Dr. Haytham. Thank you, Dr. Adib. Now, we'll go to the main meal today, as Dr. Adib mentioned, cardiopulmonary interaction in high-frequency oscillatory ventilation. So, as we know, that in normal breathing, the intrathoracic pressure oscillates between negative pressure during inspiration and a little bit positive pressure during expiration. This allows the intrathoracic pressure to be low, right? Ethereal pressure will be low. Also, the venous uh, system inside the thorax will become more distended. And so more inflow and venous return will go to the RV. And it's also well known that the RV is volume dependent uh, chamber with more volume, more cardiac output. In high frequency ventilation and uh, which is type of positive pressure ventilation, intrathoracic pressure become always in the positive sides. So how can this affect the preload and afterload of RV and LV? Regarding the RV preload, because of positive pressure ventilation and compression on intrathoracic uh, veins, the right atrial pressure will increase and the venous return will go down to the RV. And by this concept, the RV output will be low. So in patients with congestive heart failure where they depend on passive flow of uh, uh, of uh, blood, this will not be a good choice, but will be discussed later. On LV preload, decreasing RV output will also, by the way, decreasing the LV preload. But this has little effect on the LV. As we know that the cardiac output of LV equal stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. 
stroke volume is dependent on contractility, preload, and afterload. And despite of decreasing preload to the R to the LV, but the LV is much more muscular than the RV. So it has what's called more reserve to compensate this decrease in preload. Other way to look to the to this uh, decreased preload is the interventricular dependence. On hypervolemia, if you find here to this shape, you find the RV is more distended with over volume. And so the interventricular septum is bulging into the RV. So this will impair the interventricular dependence and also decrease the LV uh, cardiac output. With decreasing this venous return, in case of hypervolemia, the RV will go to normal size and interventricular septum will go to the middle, so the interventricular dependence will be better. So with decreasing LV preload, actually this might improve the LV cardiac output. If the patient is normal or hypovolemic, we'll find this interventricular septum bulging on the other way. This also will impair the LV output. Regarding the afterload, there's big misconception that using high frequency ventilation, especially, and all type of positive ventilation, positive pressure ventilation, this will increase by the way on all times the RV afterload. But this actually not actually 100% uh, true. If we look to this diagram, which represents the relation between lung volume and pulmonary vascular resistance, you will find this with uh, high lung volume, pulmonary vascular resistance will increase. But also with low lung volume and case of atelexis, also the pulmonary vascular resistance as shown here in this diagram will also increase because of hypoxic vasoconstriction that will happen to the uh, pulmonary arterioles. So the optimum uh, lung volume associated with low vascular resistance. So if you have patient who needs actually recruitment, and if you put this patient on high frequency mechanical ventilation, this will improve the RV afterload. But if you are using high frequency oscillatory ventilation in wrong way, as we mentioned before, and if you used high settings, you will go to the over distension zone. At this point, you will increase the, L the RV afterload. Okay, so the LV is another story. LV afterload depends on the what's called transmural pressure, which means the difference between pressure in the aorta and outside the aorta. In negative uh, pressure ventilation or spontaneous ventilation, the transmural pressure is much higher than positive pressure ventilation. This means that the afterload on the LV is better and lower than spontaneous ventilation. Same concept if you apply it to the wall of the LV called LV wall stress, which means the difference across the wall of LV. With positive pressure ventilation, difference across the wall of LV is low. And so the function is better and need for oxygen demands is less with high frequency ventilation and other type of positive pressure ventilation. So let's summarize all of this up. If you have high mean airway pressure represented by beep here, you may have factors that can decrease cardiac output and factors that can increase cardiac output. You will find the factor will increase cardiac output is more on the left ventricle, which increase, decrease left ventricle after load and decrease preload and decrease oxygen demand. Also, it improves hypoxia and so improving the pulmonary vascular, vascular uh, uh, resistance. And the factors that can decrease the cardiac output, it's more on the right ventricle. So let's apply this to our BCICU patients. We can roughly divide our BCICU patients into preoperative and postoperative patients. Preoperative patient can be further divided into patient with congenital heart disease presenting with acute respiratory distress syndrome and patient of persistent pulmonary hypertension. Postoperative patient can be divided into patient who did corrective cardiac surgery and patient who did palliative cardiac surgery. Now let's go to the patients who have congenital heart disease. And this study published at 2021, uh, they test the use of high frequency jet ventilation with all types of congenital heart disease. And they compared regarding to the improved uh, gas exchange between both groups. And they found that compared with the conventional mechanical ventilation, patient on high frequency jet ventilation, they have significant lower BH and significant wash of CO2 and oxygenation in both are the same. Also, there's another study that tests hemodynamics between high-frequency oscillatory ventilations 
and conventional mechanical ventilation in preterm. And they look for the size of uh, beta and ductus arteriosus as a flow and as a closure as indication of pulmonary vascular resistance. And they look uh, for the cardiac index as uh, a parameter of LV. And they found that in patient of conventional mechanical ventilation, there was reduction in size of uh, BDA and this indicates that in patients with high frequency oscillatory ventilation, they have much lower pulmonary vascular resistance. That's why the BDA didn't close in those patients. And the LV performance was the same between both groups. So now we can say that patient with congenital heart disease, we can use high frequency oscillatory ventilation safely on these patients. Let's talk about patients with resistant pulmonary hypertension of newborn and actually one of the strong point for the use of high frequency oscillatory ventilation, especially if combined with inhaled nitric oxide. This study uh, was uh, comparing between use of inhaled nitric oxide alone and use of inhaled nitric oxide with conventional mechanical ventilation and use of high frequency oscillatory ventilation alone and combination between inhaled nitric oxide and high frequency ventilation. They picked up a lot of cases of uh, um, uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension of different causes like uh, respiratory distress syndrome, meconium aspiration, idiopathic, pulmonary hypoplasia, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And we found this with treatment of uh, inhaled nitric oxide and high frequency oscillatory ventilation was better than use of conventional mechanical ventilation with inhaled nitric oxide and was even better than use of using high frequency oscillatory ventilation alone. In this study, it was comparing use of inhaled nitric oxide with high frequency jet ventilation and high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Is this a difference between both groups? And they found that it's short, the short outcome in both groups are the same. So now we can say this with resistant pulmonary hypertension, high frequency oscillatory ventilation is a good choice, especially if combined with inhaled nitric oxide. Let's go to the post operative patients and will see the patients after correct cardiac surgery. This was a revolutionary study. At this study, they, are, they used the high frequency oscillatory ventilation from day zero as a routine post-operative uh, uh, mechanical ventilation instead of conventional mechanical ventilation. And compare this to other group who were using conventional mechanical ventilation. And the target of the study is to test the length of mechanical ventilation length of ICU stay and uh, morbidity between two groups. Uh, this study found that the patient on high frequency mechanical ventilation, they have a uh, uh, short duration of mechanical ventilation, short duration of ICU stay, and the same prevalence of mortality between both groups. But they found an interesting finding that in patients on high frequency mechanical ventilation, the documented uh, pulmonary hypertension is much higher which can be uh, uh, sort of as a, a complication of high frequency ventilation. But if you look to the ICU stay and length of high frequency stay, you can say that the high frequency actually treated this group better than conventional mechanical ventilation. So this also high evidence that high frequency uh, mechanical venti uh, uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilation has good effect on pulmonary vascular resistance. And this was a list of, uh, uh, of the cases done in uh, this study. And you find that most of them are a little bit complicated cases. Another study was done as using the high frequency as a rescue therapy uh, in improving the gas exchange. And they found that the patient who are using high frequency oscillatory ventilation as a rescue therapy, they have better gas exchange more than the uh, conventional mechanical ventilation. So now we can say also high frequency mechanical ventilation can be used in patient after corrective cardiac surgery. Now let's go to the point of debate, palliative surgery. Uh, we know that the Fontaine operation, uh, it means connection of uh, uh, SVC and IVC to the uh, uh, right pulmonary artery. And actually this is venous arterial anastomosis that go against pressure, pressure gradient and also against uh, uh, gravity. So with uh, post pressure ventilation and high frequency ventilation, as we mentioned before, there is compression on the intrathoracic uh, grade veins. 
So the venous return will be affected theoretically for this patient. Now let's go to studies. This was study uh, using high frequency jet ventilation, not high frequency oscillatory ventilation. And they found that patient on high frequency jet ventilation, they have 50% reduction in the required mean airway pressure for the standing lung and 59% reduction of the pulmonary vascular resistance and 25% uh, uh, increase in the cardiac index. This is the same study was repeated uh, in Canada, uh, but using high frequency oscillatory ventilation. As you compared the same patient after using intermittent uh, uh, conventional mechanical ventilation, and then switched the patient to high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation. But they found there is no effect on cardiac output, no effect on pulmonary vascular resistance on both groups. Maybe the difference between two studies that uh, the previous one used high frequency jet ventilation, which used uh, a lower mean airway pressure than high frequency oscillatory ventilation. But anyway, it's still debated that uh, uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilation can be used after Fontaine operation. So now let's talk about high frequency ventilation and ECMO. How can or why can we use uh, uh, high frequency ventilation in ECMO? As we know that ECMO give us a dramatic, uh, 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 great and good uh, ABG. But and during ECMO, we should put the patient on conventional mechanical ventilation on protective lung strategy. Sometimes if you are targeting low tidal volume from two to three ml per kg, uh, you find that conven conventional mechanical ventilation gives the patient too much pressure. This will uh, uh, make uh, barotrauma to the patient. So at this point, high frequency oscillatory ventilation is a good option. And if your patient on high frequency oscillatory ventilation, sometimes this patient cannot tolerate excessive hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis. So adding ECMO is a good way to eliminate this uh, uh, carbon dioxide. And the question was, what about the hemodynamics in both modalities? The study was done in 2012 in Germany on adult patients, comparing patient on AV ECMO uh, alone and patient on AV ECMO plus high frequency oscillatory ventilation. And they found that patient on uh, uh, both ECMO and high frequency oscillatory ventilation have dramatic response for wash of CO2 and uh, more protective lung strategy and less lung injury. And they found that hemodynamics between both groups, there's no difference between the hemodynamics and use of vasopressor or noradrenaline uh, uh, did increase in the group of high frequency oscillatory ventilation. And actually they gave us uh, uh, um, this beautiful uh, algorithm uh, if you have patient with respiratory distress syndrome, you are using lung protective ventilation and position uh, maneuver. If you find that patient has uh, a high oxygen requirement with high B pressure of 14, at this point, you can use high frequency oscillatory ventilation. If you find that the patient has respiratory metabolic acidosis and cannot be tolerated on conventional mechanical ventilation with high BIB pressure, at this choice, senior uh, registrar or the consultant can choose either to put him on high frequency oscillatory ventilation or AV. If you have patient already on high frequency oscillatory ventilation, but you have persistent respiratory acidosis, at the time you can use AV ECMO in addition to the uh, high frequency ventilation. If you have patient on AV ECMO and you are using ultra uh, protective ventilator strategy and you are using low tidal volume with high BIB pressure, here you can use high frequency ventilation to uh, uh, minimize the lung injury by conventional mechanical ventilation. I so what? Uh, two, uh, other two balls, can we just put the other two balls before we proceed to the new modalities of HFO? Okay, I, I, I have two couples, two slides remaining, so we can uh, yeah, well, ask our two. questions. Go ahead, Dr. Ali, please, and put the ball questions. So, so 
So we'll ask now about uh, high frequency and the cardiac function. So do you think guys that high frequency can depress the cardiac function? The bull did not come yet, Dr. Ali. Yeah, I think the host, Dr. Abdullah, probably will not uh, be able to see until we share. Uh, okay. So, yeah, around like 50% uh, of the uh, uh, candidates, they are uh, answering. So, we'll give like um, around 10 seconds, then after that, we'll share the results. Okay. So I can say there is no clear answer for this. So we around 53% they think it could depress and 47% 40, they think it is could uh, 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 actually there is no effect of the cardiac function. Uh, and I guess the NO answer being uh, uh, been already uh, verified on the on the talk. So here, do you think uh, in all in conventional um, uh, mechanical ventilation can be reduced while using the high frequency? Like, If we think theoretically, uh, probably yes, in case there is a limit of leak. Okay, so we'll share the results. I guess uh, around 56% they think uh, it is, uh, could be reduced, uh, where, uh, like 20% uh, think there is no effect, and uh, uh, around 23% they think it is sometimes. Thank you. Shukran, Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, thank you. Continue with your Dr. Ali. Now let's talk about the last part of our lecture today. What's the new modality of high frequency oscillatory ventilation? I will be honest with you, I didn't see these modalities, I didn't deal with them, I just read about them. If you have any experience, we can share about this in the end of the lecture. So one of the newest modalities and uh, published 2021 is using high frequency volume guarantee in patients uh, of acute hypoxic respiratory failure after congenital uh, heart surgery. Uh, high frequency oscillatory ventilation demand on giving target tidal volume to the patients on high frequency and give the maximum delta B for this uh, uh, patient. And the machine will adjust the actual delta B to give the desired tidal volume. Here in the high frequency, there is a parameters we know, if I O2, uh, um, frequency, IE ratio, delta B, uh, delta B and mean airway pressure. Here in volume guarantee, there is two values uh, extra Tidal volume, which represents the maximum volume can be given to the patients, and maximum delta B. So in this uh, study, we found that in high frequency oscillatory ventilation using volume guarantee, uh, there is decreased in fluctuation of tidal volume and more wash of CO2. And so the workload of bedside regarding uh, uh, um, consultants and uh, doctors in ICU is less. Uh, because the machine adjusting himself uh, for to give the desired tidal volume, so it can increase or decrease the delta B uh, as long as it's in the uh, uh, desired value. Uh, one of the newest modalities is use of nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation instead of nasal CBAP in patients after uh, uh, congenital heart surgery. And this study also published in 2021. And they found that patient 
after extubation on high frequency, nasal high frequency oscillatory ventilation, there is improving in CO2 wash than CBAB and better uh, uh, pH, but there is no difference on other outcome like reintubation or oxygenation index or need for pulmonary recruitment. So this is the conclusion of our lecture today, uh, that high frequency oscillatory ventilation in cardiac ICU is not forbidden, can be used and should be uh, with cushion and should be in the right point. That high frequency oscillatory ventilation helps LV function. It decreases the afterload. It decreases the oxygen demand to the LV and should be used with cushion in case of RV dysfunction because of over distension will impair the afterload of RV. High frequency oscillatory ventilation, not the first choice after Fontaine operation because this is passive shunting. Uh, and if you, it's mandatory to use high frequency ventilation, high frequency jet ventilation is better uh, alternative. High frequency oscillatory ventilation can be used in ECMO as a protective lung strategy. If you find that conventional mechanical ventilation is, uh, is uh, subjecting the patient to part of trauma. New modalities of high frequency oscillatory ventilation seems to be promising, but I think there's still not efficient studies about this. And now let's share your experience regarding use of high frequency ventilation, especially in BCICU patients. This was our reference and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Haytham, uh, for this detailed talk about high frequency and um, Really, it was interesting for me to sit with you and have it before and now. Uh, we have um, a lot of attendance from our senior colleagues, and we have a lot of friends who will help us in uh, moderating this session to Dr. Abdullah Tayyip, Dr. Al Harbi, Dr. Abdullah Gobeshi is our colleague from Kafafa, who will lead discussion. Before we start uh, receiving the questions, uh, the um, mic is open for Dr. Abdullah and anyone who has a comment about. <coughs> the using of new modalities of uh, nasal high frequency in pediatric cardiac ICU. Uh, I don't have this facility so far in my institute. I'm not sure if others have it. Please, Dr. Abdullah Ghubeshi, go ahead and uh, moderate. Thank you. Thank you, Haytham, for a nice presentation. Thank you for uh, amazing uh, animation uh, you put in your slide. Thank you for simpl uh, simplifying the the high frequency uh, physiology, uh, gas exchange, and also the, uh, the cardiomimary interaction uh, you mentioned uh, for us. Uh, everyone, I think, uh, uh, gets some message. Uh, everyone in this uh, discussion, uh, this uh, presentation, uh, gets uh, uh, some benefit. Uh, now we, we kind of start, I mean, uh, a question for uh, Dr. Haytham and uh, some of the audience also. Dr. Hani, <clears throat> unmute yourself and you can start your question. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful uh, slides, wonderful explanation, Dr. Haytham. Saraha, very, very interesting. And I do hope that uh, please, if you can have a recording shared with the our colleagues, I would uh, love to share it with our uh, fellows. Inshallah, Dr. Hani, inshallah. The recording inshallah. Is, uh, is there. Magnificent. Uh, the question I will just ask, plus maybe it may be a comment, just to make sure, as you notice in the NICU literature, just make sure, are they talking about the same machine, the one uh, we are using? I think it's uh, Sensoromedix, is it uh, our uh, same high frequency? Or are they using the, uh, the other uh, machines? As you mentioned, there's the uh, with the volume guarantee. So it's uh, somewhat different because over there, as you explained in your uh, topic, uh, Dr. Haytham, uh, the machine has, uh, uh, what do you call it? It has an active and passive exhalation in inhalation. So as the piston goes in and out. So there may be some slight changes in the mechanism versus the other uh, uh, NICU or the neonatal uh, in some hospitals or settings, just to make sure. Uh, so this is where, and uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not yet, yet familiar with the uh, nasal high frequency. We may be seeing it more and more in the future. Hopefully, if it can be an added modality in our tools, that will be helpful. 
thank you. So this is my question. The literature doesn't differentiate between the machines, uh, just to make sure we are not mixing, you know, the oranges and the uh, apple and oranges, maybe the oranges and uh, maybe mandarins together or something like that. Shukran. Thank you, Dr. Hani. Actually, this is a very good question. Uh, regarding the, uh, there is um, uh, different modules of high frequency ventilation, but the most common one is the one we are seeing here in the, uh, in the screen. It's called care fusion. There is two types of this one, 3100A and 3100B. And this is the most um, uh, accepted mode of ventilation uh, because it's uh, not um, other con a combination of other conventional and uh, high frequency, it's just high frequency. So the, uh, I think most of guidelines are talking about this, uh, this machine because we know this in this machine, they have the best tone and it acts in both ways. There is other types uh, like dragger, some, uh, for example, dragger uh, ventilation, they can uh, open high frequency mode, but I, I don't think the, um, they can be used actually, but uh, I, I think the more specific uh, model we are using here, and this was uh, also the model I, we are using in our uh, PCICU, and can be uh, applied for neonate, can be applied for pediatrics, uh, the two types, 3100A, used up to three, uh, 35 kg, and 3100B used for patient more than uh, 35 kg. So this yeah. mode, this ventilator can be applied even for, uh, <clears throat> for new needs. Yeah, and you know, this ventilator has stood over the decades, I wouldn't say years, decades, and even with the same interface, which make it somewhat easy for the beginners and easy for the seniors like so uh, I, I think this is a, they patented the machine i think it's patented to this company per se so just to keep in mind uh, I, i'm my comment is only when you are reading something in the literature make sure which machine is it the same like the one you have in uh, your settings or uh, uh, just across the the hall with your nicu colleagues just to make sure this is my comment Thank you, Dr. Haitham. Thank you, thank you, Bye -bye. Dr. Hani, for our comment. Uh, we have we have uh, we have the same machine since Robert Dix, and also uh, some of the hospital we work also uh, we, they have uh, the Draeger uh, machine with good uh, main screen. Uh, but uh, from my from my little experience, that uh, since Robert Dix, I think uh, work a lot and uh, have good benefit uh, better than Draeger. This is just my personal uh, I mean uh, experience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hani. Now we can go to. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Al-Bahiri, you can Abdullah, mute yourself. The SLA machine has been used, the one I show on my screen, has been used by some neonatologists for the small infants. They don't like our Bistom machine because uh, it's uh, more gentle for this patient. Uh, for uh, me, I have this machine in my hospital and I have the Bistom machine. But my preference is to use the Bistom machine because I'm really comfortable and I know how to adjust it. So at the end, whatever the literature said, whatever you have, use the machine that you are comfortable and confident that you can manage the side effect and the sitting during the ventilating of cardiac ICU patients. Thank you, Adi, for our comment. Uh, we can go to Mahmoud, Mahmoud Al-Bahiri, Dr. Mahmoud. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Regarding uh, the new modality, high frequency therapy ventilation with volume guarantee, is there a, an adjustment for uh, tidal volume? Like I have to adjust the tidal volume, like the space 1.5 ml per kg? Actually, tidal volume will be set as maximum 2, uh, uh, two ml per kg, and the range from 1.5 to 2 ml per kg. So you adjust this as the maximum tidal volume above the mean airway pressure, and give the maximum delta B, uh, it's like, 10 to 20 percent above the regular delta B using in regular ventilation. So the machine will adjust himself regarding the breathing of the patient. If you found that the so tidal mean, volume I mean, is high. It, it, do I have to adjust it myself or the machine no, no. will adjust it automatically? Automatically. You just put the uh, desired values and the machine will yes. adjust delta B automatically. So here, okay. uh, if you see in this picture, adjusted delta B is 36. And the machine adjusts yes. itself for 30. This is actual delta B given to the patients. And that's why in the finding in this study, they found that using this modality will decrease the workload of the medical staff, 
you will not go to the patient for every 10 minutes or 13 minutes and to adjust the delta B. The machine will do it by itself. And uh, the, as you said, the CO2 wash is better with this, uh, in this uh, way. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for your question. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Zahir. Thank you very much for uh, this very nice activity and presentation. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is uh, why after so many years of um, uh, using uh, this um, high frequency machines and uh, modalities, we're still having theories for uh, how does it work? Why we don't have uh, a solid base of understanding how uh, does this uh, mode of ventilation would work? السؤال الثاني اللي متعلق بيه برضو إنه إيش معنى هذه الشركة الوحيدة اللي نقول محتكرة تصنيع يعني شركة أو شركتين محتكرة تصنيع this mode of ventilation هل أي أحد يقدر ينورنا to shed some lights on this thank you أجاب الجزء الأول أنا وأسيب الجزء الثاني للسينيورز اللي في الجروب بالنسبة للجزء الأول دكتور Uh, Zahir, thank you for your question. And the people is not doesn't like high frequency in the small kids who has a lot of hemodynamic instability. Our beliefs it's because we used to manage unconventional ventilation and go for surgery quickly and get them post surgical quickly, and then we have ECMO machine faster than high frequency machine because we have the cardiac surgeon, we have everything to utilize the high frequency machine. The people still has misconception about the effect of cardiovascular interaction, especially in the RV after load, uh, and they try to avoid it. And that's why we bought these questions and the ball in the middle. And as you can see in the middle, most of the ball questions, the people are still not familiar. They didn't like the high frequency and believe in it. And from our experience, uh, personal as a deep, I use it in BCICU. I, I wasn't comfortable initially. And then I use it in five patients. I have four who really improved with it. The fifth one, I have to bridge to ECMO. So I think it's our comfort zone rather than its understanding of physiology. About the machine and the components, I don't know. I have no answer. Maybe our senior colleague, or Dr. Abdullah Gobesh, have answer. Please go ahead. Unfortunately, I, I don't have, have answer, Adi, for this, uh, this uh, I mean, uh, company uh, in fall. But what we know, we have Synthromedics and we have Sleeve uh, from uh, Draeger uh, company. This is the two, I mean, the old machine and the new machine. Uh, this is what we know. I don't know about the other machine, other companies, if they have, uh, they have the mode for uh, high frequency oscillator or not. Uh, if some of uh, our colleagues, I mean, the senior, uh, they have comment, Dr. Hani, you can go. Yeah, so uh, I, in one of the conferences, uh, I visited their booth, uh, the company, and I asked him a similar question. I didn't ask him about uh, why you, you are only, you are the only one. I asked him why you are not changing the, you know, the interface, why you're not having more, uh, uh, you know, some of the knobs are very sensitive. You just change it a little bit and you find the numbers go very high for a small baby. So he said, you know, we keep on our uh, research and blah, blah, blah. It looks like they are having some minor ongoing research, which they upgrade or they continue their patent. You know, so it's a matter of patent registration. So this is my, uh, my feeling that it's a matter of patent that uh, no other companies can use it. So it's exclusive for these uh, patent owner. So... But the, the good news, it's working fine. I mean, this is one of, uh, look at the other side, you know, the half, half uh, glass, uh, half of the bottle empty, half full. The other good news is that uh, everywhere, any place you go, it's the same interface. Everyone is comfortable with it. I don't think it, and as uh, Dr. Haytham showed in the slides, uh, it's very easy to use. So mm. this is what, Uh, this is what, I, to the best of my knowledge, this is the, the answer, Wallahu alam. Thank you, Hakimna. Thank you, Dr. I think, uh, uh, Iman, uh, Dr. Iman, you can uh, ask now. Unmute yes. yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for this uh, wonderful lecture, Dr. Haytham. Um, 
uh, I just like to know, I mean, when you are comfort, I mean, you are comfortable more in putting your patients, cardiac patients on high frequency. Uh, is it, are you more comfortable before surgery, after surgery? And if after surgery, when? Immediately when he, they are coming from the, uh, the theater and how can you observe for the wiggling if the sternum is still open? Uh, these questions. Thank you, Dr. Iman. As Dr. Adib mentioned uh, just a few seconds, uh, our use of, to, for high frequency is just as a rescue syrup. Uh, our routine care is putting the patient after uh, surgery or before surgery if needs ventilation on conventional mechanical ventilation. So our use for high frequency, just if conventional mechanical ventilation fail. At this point, we are using high frequency uh, ventilation. So even pre-operative, post-operative, we are using just as a rescue after failing okay. of conventional ventilation. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the other uh, questions? How you observe for the wiggle if it's... Uh... Yeah, wiggling is actually, uh, yani it's obvious. Uh, you will find the patient vibrating. So you see the level of vibration. It should be from nipples to umbilicus and uh, neonates, in infants down to the pelvis, and in older children and adolescents, uh, uh, should be down to the mid side. If you find that in the same delta B, your wiggling increased, that means that the lung become better and compliance of the lung is improved. So you can go down to the delta B. If you find that the wiggling disappeared on one side, so you should think of either a tube deviated to one side or there is secretion obstructing uh, this side. If you find that the wiggling is decreasing in both sides, so you should think of maybe incre uh, increasing compliance and not good response, or maybe there is actual secretion obstructing the main trachea or ATT. Thank you, Haytham, for the comment. And thank you, Dr. Iman for a question. I just say you want to ask a question for our uh, respected I mean, senior uh, cardiac ICU, uh, uh, having cardiac ICU experience. Uh, how frequent uh, we are using high frequency uh, in your unit and uh, uh, what is the, I mean, the cases that you are using uh, high frequency? Can somebody... Uh, Abdullah, if you allow me, I'm uh, Abdullah Tay from BSCC. Uh, I just I want to comment a few comments. Uh, first, about the uh, the use of high frequency in cardiac ICU, it is still less used. And the high frequency started by the neonatologist, as we all know, and most of the studies for the high frequencies from the neonatology people, and it is well well tolerated, well adapted, and well done there. In, in, in adult, it used for uh, respiratory distress syndrome with good uh, uh, predictors and good outcome. <clears throat> in pediatric, in cardiac ICU, still starting, still people didn't get all the concept and still afraid for uh, the hemodynamics. So uh, still on breaks. That's why we are inviting these lectures to be done and to uh, teach and to adjust the people about that. This is the first comment. The second comment, about the machines. As much as I know, we have this sensor medic, which is very good machine for the kids, as mentioned before. And now we have this uh, uh, dragger. Uh, the beautiful of this dragger, it is can play this, the two uh, setting, the conventional and the high frequency. The drop back of the dragger is, should be used of less than 10 kg. Above 10 kg, it will not work as high frequency. It will be used only for conventional. So we have this in our center. We have the dragger machine, which we are using as high frequency, and then we change the machine because you know, in high frequency, to to prepare the machine to bring this big sensor medic machine and to put the patient and then to remove it and to put the convention machine again, this will take time and it will affect the patient outcome also or uh, stability of the patient. So the dragger is a beautiful machine we are using now with a small ba baby's infant less than ten kg, and it is good really. Uh, the third comment about high flow nasal cannula, uh, high frequency, high flow nasal cannula, it's used in neonatology uh, and with very good outcome. But uh, in, in cardiac ICU, as Dr. Haysam mentioned, and by the way, it's very good presentation, Dr. Haysam. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Very detailed, very fruitful presentation. Uh, it looks like uh, it's not 
having good outcome, but I don't know whether we will use it. I want to hear from our big center here, from um, the National Guard. We have uh, Dr. Abdel Rauh, I see in the, in the um, uh, presentation now, attending now. From the King Faisal, we have Dr. Reem and Dr. Yasser, and from King Fahad Medical City, we have uh, Dr. Nada and Dr. Ali, and Dr. Uh, Jihad. I want to hear from them about their experience in high frequency in cardiac ICU and also about uh, high flow nasal cannula, high frequency in cardiac patient. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, Dr. Abdullah, I just also to keep every one of our senior colleague and everyone to just answer this question while we are chatting. Does the availability of the ECMO machine and the surgeon around us in cardiac ICU minimize the use of high frequency ventilation. Like when I get it at risk of with hypoxemia, you know what, just get the ECMO machine. I can get it very quickly. The surgeon, they want good outcome. Does it affect actually uh, us as intensivists to, to use or utilize our resource for high frequency? Dr. Abdullah. Abdul al uh, I think uh, you, you can speak Dr. Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Please. Yes, doctor. Shukran uh, Haytham Wadib. Thank you for this excellent lecture. Uh, I think uh, the, the uh, at least the good thing from this lecture is uh, it opens our eyes to use this uh, uh, ventilation mode because I think we have been shying from using it in cardiac ICUs. And it's clear that as Haytham showed, it's safe. Uh, if you use it on the right patient, it's better outcome. Uh, as Abdullah Tayyib said, we are using it uh, in our unit for many years now. Uh, we are using Draeger. I don't want to make any uh, advertisement, but I think if you have a cardiac ICU and you don't have a Draeger machine that can be high used as high frequency, you should buy one or two. Uh, it has uh, it saved uh, many lives in our unit, uh, and I recommend it to have it to have it in your unit if you're dealing with cardiac patient. Uh, I'm not sure, as Adib said, I'm not sure that uh, we uh, were using high frequency for a sick patient. First of all, we don't, usually we don't have very sick respiratory wise patient unless they came from OR with uh, like injury to the lung, uh, reperfusion or transfusion related uh, injury. Uh, that's why we don't need to use high frequency on very sick post-op cardiac patient with open chest because I don't think it's practical. And as Adib said, we usually call for ECMO. Uh, to risk the lung, uh, but maybe in some cases we could have avoided uh, the ECMO by using the uh, this uh, this mode of ventilation, the high frequency, especially the JIT form, not the oscillation, because I think those, uh, the oscillation is difficult to to start, difficult to maintain, uh, and difficult to win. To me, at least, uh, I, I know some people are comfortable with it; uh, they prefer it. But I think if you are if you get used to the JIT ventilation, the high frequency JIT ventilation, uh, as Haytham showed it's better alternative than oscillation ventilation. Uh, I think that's that's important point to uh, to come up from the structure is that we, we can use the high frequency in the cardiac patients uh, for those who need it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for your comment. Uh, Dr. Jamil, uh, you can unmute yourself. Dr. Jamil Ghamdi, I think, uh, our colleague. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa uh, thank you for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I am uh, Jamil Ghamdi, uh, an ICU consultant at Dahi University. Just three comments about uh, the use of uh, high frequency in uh, neonates, uh, especially the nasal uh, high frequency. We do use it uh, as an non-phaser in uh, neonatal uh, in ICU if we failed uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, IVV. So if we uh, failed in uh, non-invasive uh, uh, British ventilation, as a mode of uh, weaning in IBBD. So we use it uh, as alternative before uh, we reintubate the baby, especially if the CO2 is very high in blood gas after uh, extubation. Uh, this is regarding the nasal high frequency. Regarding the company, we, we do uh, have different company as mentioned by my colleague, uh, Draeger, one of the company. And then the NIC we use uh, Leoni. I don't know if uh, the people they are using or not. So we, we do have a Leonic company. Uh, we use it as a uh, high frequency beside the uh, Draeger and uh, sensor medics. And uh, the last thing, the advantage is uh, B, uh, BN uh, 500, uh, the Draeger, uh, especially is the noisy sound. As mentioned by Dr. Abdullah Tayyip, we use it in uh, the NICU. 
and the advantage that we, you have the conventional and the, the high frequency in the same machine. And the noisy sound is very less in comparison to uh, sensor, uh, sensor matrix, especially in the NICU. So it is an excellent uh, machine. Uh, this is the only three comments about uh, the use of high frequency in NICU. And uh, again, thank you very much uh, for the lecture. Thank you, Dr. Jamil, for your uh, feedback and your uh, nice comment and uh, awareness about uh, the, the mood and available in the market. Uh, Dr. Hayam uh, our uh, pediatric cardiologist, uh, you can speak now. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Hayam for this very extensive review and all the organizing committee. I think I'm the only cardiologist in, uh, in the group. And um, excuse my ignorance, but uh, what strikes me actually is the use of high frequency ventilation for patient in ECMO. And I'm not sure that I grabbed the concept uh, right. And again, I don't know if it's been used here or somebody used it and uh, does it have any advantage over the conventional or if you have any criteria to put the patient in high frequency while they are on uh, ECMO. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayam. Yeah, yeah, I'm pleased to allow in. Uh, Dr. Hayam is our uh, pediatric cardiology consultant in uh, Chafa. Uh, I'm very pleased for your comment. Uh, actually, during uh, AV ECMO, we should put patients on conventional mechanical ventilation as a protective lung strategy because without ventilation, the lung will collapse. And during weaning of ECMO, this will need higher settings of uh, conventional mechanical ventilation and will increase the settings and this will cause more lung injury. So during conventional mechanical ventilation, we are using low tidal volume strategy, which is called a uh, protective lung strategy. We are using low tidal volume from two to four ML, uh, ML per kg uh, body weight. And we adjust this tidal volume and we'll see what the pressure will have it on uh, conventional mechanical ventilation. Sometimes when the lung condition is good, we'll, uh, uh, the mechanical ventilation will give us a reasonable uh, BIB. But in other conditions, especially with prolonged ventilation, uh, the BIB will become higher. As we mentioned here, BIB above 30. Above 30, this will make more injury to the lung by bar trauma. Uh, even the tidal volume is low, but the high BIB will make the lung more injurious. So at this point, it's better to put the patient on high frequency mechanical ventilation just to keep the lung uh, patent and protected because eventually we'll wean the patient from AV ECMO and he will depend on the, his own lung. If the lung is injured and we'll find, as we see several times, failure of uh, weaning of ECMO because of respiratory issue. So that's why we are using uh, high frequency and instead of conventional mechanical ventilation with uh, AV ECMO. Dr. Adib, if you have uh, additional comments. Uh, thank you, Haitam. Me and Dr. Haitam actually went over this part. It was interesting review for us for this study was then Japan to use the high frequency in VA ECMO. Germany. Uh, and we decided just to put it for the sake of interest of coaches. And <laughs> I was surprised. I was expecting this coaching from intensivist, but it was interesting for me. And it's really interesting to make, I'm going to review a lot of things to see what is the criteria to put this patient on high frequency. My belief, whatever you need to rest your lung, just do it rather than the high frequency. But I really find this interesting result, though there's a number of uh, sample that they use is very small uh, number. But we'll put it for the sake of discussion and to open mind that high frequency is available tool in our ICUs and it has been ignored at the storeroom. And we should bring it to the bedside to use it just before to go to the complication of ECMO. Uh, I, if you, Dr. Abdullah, wish allow me and Dr. Haytam and uh, colleagues, I would like to hear from our experts, Dr. Ayman uh, Iyadi. I think he's in our lecture. Dr. Al um, Harbi also. I didn't hear it was just Dr. Jad Zahra. And any other colleague, I couldn't catch his name. Please go ahead and tell us about your experience and your belief. Adib, I think now we have uh, Dr. Zahrani, I think. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Zahrani, I think he raising hand. Uh, I think Dr. Abdullah, you can speak. Dr. Abdullah? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for your nice uh, presentations and uh, uh, topics in the cardiac ICU, the high frequency. 
just the small comments about, you know, uh, ECMO and high frequency. I use it, you know, when I, I need to quit recruit the lungs for uh, weaning from ECMO. Uh, you know, face it for a patient, you know, you have like, you know, I use it for a patient with the stenosis, uh, aortic stenosis and vitamin B, ECMO, then we put on it. And the patient's lungs was white and we use it quickly to recruit the lungs and wean him quickly from the VA ECMO. So just, uh, you know, if you look to the principle of uh, uh, high frequency, it is the best mode to ventilate patient in the safe window. So it provides ultra prote protection for the lungs. Uh, so that's why it is a CPAP and you're oscillating around this CPAP. So it is the best mode to protect the lungs from lung injuries. So this is the main principle of high frequency. The second thing, it is oxygenation independent from ventilation. So uh, if, you, if you have a ventilation issues, uh, you know, you can you can use it without affecting oxygenation. The same thing for oxygenation. So not like a conventional ventilation uh, that when you play with the uh, PIP pressure to ventilate the patient or rate, you, you might affect oxygenation the opposite way. So it is independent oxygen from ventilation. So it is easy to be used uh, and it's provide ultra protection for the lungs. Uh, we use it rarely in, in cardiac patient because main cause of our cardiac is not lung disease. Uh, and we use it for a rescue when we have like a bad lung disease, like a reperfusion injury or, you know, uh, or some lung condition associated with cardiac. Uh, this is my just few about, you know, uh, the high frequency use in, in, in our cardiac ICU or uh, uh, our experience with the high frequency. Uh, you know, I, I, we have a lot of, now it is the, the Chinese company trying to uh, you know, put this mode in the other ventilators and we saw it in the markets, uh, but I never use it uh, with, with other, other than breakers and uh, sensomedics. So, so this is my, you know, uh, uh, comment about high frequency and thank you guys for uh, uh, giving these uh, topics, interesting topics in the cardiac. Uh, yeah, you. Thank you so much. Zahrani, you should answer the question that I keep asking every colleague. Do you think the availability of ECMO machine very quickly in cardiac ICU is affecting our use of high frequency ventilation? You know, uh, what I cannot say that, you know, because of uh, available of uh, ECMO, most of our cardiac, you know, in, when he failing, most likely it is suited with the cardiac depressions or high enotropes, you know, uh, keeping, you know, most of our patient unstable. And, you know, we move to ECMO faster than, you know, using high frequency because we, we know that, you know, high frequency might affect the hemodynamic more and uh, put a patient in a bad condition. So that's why, we know, we know when we have a patient, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, cardiopulmonary interactions is affected because of cardiac function, we go to ECMO. It's not because uh, availability of the, uh, of the ECMO. So that's my impression about, you know, the high frequency. I never use it for, you know, uh, patient failing heart or something and had lung edema. So I prefer to, you know, uh, go on ECMO and risk the lungs better than, you know, uh, how about him in high frequency? At least if you have like, you know, uh, draggers that you can shift the patient from conventional to high frequency and try to see if that patient improving high, her hypoxia or whatever. But most of our hypoxia is not related to, you know, because of the you know shunt lesions or residual lesions, something I, I don't think because of the lung disease. At least you have you know reperfusion injury, so maybe maybe saving using ECMO in these patients. So Abdullah, in your in your scenario, when you are avoiding the high frequency machine in cardiac ICU, do you think it's really having a bad effect in the hemodynamics, or it's just not indicated in this scenario? I cannot say we are avoiding, we use it before, but you know, uh, at the end, you might go in ECMO, okay? So if you feel that the patient is failing is not because of lung disease or, you know, lung conditions, why you go in high frequency, just put them in ECMO and risk the, the heart and the lungs. That's my impression, you know? Not because of, uh, we have to differentiate between two things, you know? Support. Is it ventilation, oxygenation issue because of the lungs or is because of limited blood flow, because of the shunt lesion, or because of, of heart failing. You know, we have to differentiate two things here. Uh, before, you know, we select which we, where we go. We know the complication from ECMOs and high risk of ECMOs and all these things. Uh, but if you think if there is some room to use high frequency before putting patient in ECMO, why not try it? Uh, but usually, you know, we, we, I mean, most, most of the cases, 
patient, you know, we have uh, issues with, with mainly cardiac issues more than lung, lung disease. Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, Dr. Harbi. Dr. Harbi, you can you can start your comments. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, guys, to give me the chance. Uh, first, I would like to thank Dr. Haitham. Uh, it's well prepared, very simplified physiology, uh, and uh, thanks for the group to bringing this talk on cardiac ICU. Yes, we list frequently uh, utilizing high frequency. Personally, probably I, I just use it for three cases, three op cases. Um, and uh, I use uh, the Draeger uh, for that. Basically, um, uh, I, I think in, in terms of the optimal beep, we probably, we utilizing less optimal beep in cardiac ICU, uh, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the worry of that, we are worried of the uh, higher PVR situation. Uh, um, However, in some situation of the under recruitment, the BVR will be uh, will be high. Uh, so uh, that that's one point. The other thing, uh, like I, I utilize it as a, a salvage in case the mechanical ventilation I reach a certain uh, uh, a certain uh, parameter, uh, then I I go for high frequency uh, at the stage. Uh, the the only disadvantage of uh, of high frequency is. I cannot monitor the uh, lung, I mean, the lung dynamic very well uh, and compared to, to the conventional. Uh, uh, probably with the conventional, I will know uh, the compliance situation, uh, uh, also the resistance situation and all of these answer. Um, but uh, it is good point. It is definitely we much less utilize it on the cardiac ICU compared uh, to the medical ICU. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for your comment. Uh, Dr. Jihad uh, Zahra, our senior uh, pediatric intensivist, you can give your comment. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. I, my comment is about the general use of high-frequency oscillator, which has been changed uh, in the maybe last couple of decades. When the adult get excited about uh, this is a new modality, we took it from the neonatal and uh, took it from us then they fail to prove it is really more effective than the conventional uh, modes with the OSCAR and oscillator trials. So the reason behind that, I think something it's a, so we can learn from, it's a lesson. How you include patient to put in the study, what kind of criteria you, you will decide that this is suitable or not. So when they try to compare the conventional with the new strategies that they have learned, and uh, high frequency, they felt uh, to prove it is better. Actually, it was worse in one of the studies. So this is what make people are drifting away from using high frequency. I'm a strong believer in uh, high frequency myself from the experience we had in the last uh, maybe a couple of decades. We saved a lot of kids like that, especially when you don't have the facility for VV ECMO in your center. In the cardiac ICU, I agree with Dr. Harbi that we are lacking the understanding of the, the cardiopulmonary interaction in the full picture. We can uh, think the same uh, concept that we have talked about in conventional, the effect on the right ventricle, the ventricle uh, recruiting the longer PR, PBR. But I think it is more complex than that. So when you use it as a selfish therapy, definitely you're not gonna get a great result to tell the people it is really great uh, modality. It is selfish therapy, it's one of the mode. If you know how to do it right, maybe you'll get a good result. That's my conclusion on that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Jihad, uh, for your comment. Uh, Dr. Ali Al Harbi, I think uh, now the phone is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, guys. And uh, uh, definitely for uh, this talk, also we're gonna to share the. Uh, uh, but to uh, to share it on YouTube channel and we'll share the link guys uh, for you. So uh, uh, thank you uh, the team from uh, Jeddah about uh, amazing preparation and the talk uh, and uh, the conclusion uh, for Dr. Adim, Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Aitam. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And thank you, my great seniors, Dr. Abdullah Obeshi, Dr. Adib, and of course, Dr. Hussam. The insoldiers here. <laughs> Thank you all for support, Dr. Hayam. Uh, 
Abrimsh, thank you all for the support, and I hope this uh, lecture will be beneficial for you and uh, can change some beliefs and uh, <laughs> our practice. It will, it will. I think it will. And I just my simple advice, everyone, and including myself. And after I read this topic, I'm gonna get it out of uh, the stack room and uh, make it at the bedside. See which patient you can use, and especially during the ECMO, I want to really and inshallah in the future let you know about our experience. Thank you a lot. Thank you all for your attendance, and we enjoy this uh, discussion and the feedback from our senior consultant. And uh, we hope we see you inshallah in the future for uh, another uh, talk, uh, amazing and interactive. Thank you, guys. Uh, well, one point, please, uh, for the uh, Western region. The, uh, we are apologize for the uh, late uh, announcement and uh, the time for prayer. So <clears throat> I think next time we'll. Uh, our presentation will be at 8.30 yeah. instead of 8 o'clock because yeah. of the prayer time. Yeah, what do you think? It's a prayer time, Abdullah. Okay. prayer time, but 7.30, we'll have 8 o'clock, and we'll have 7 o'clock. Do you think it's going to be 7 o'clock? I don't know. We'll have one day and we'll have one day. We'll have one day and we'll have one day. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.